if you don't have a life scripture for yourself, I'd say adopt this one. And this is what it says. It says, if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. As leaders and as pastors of the church, we go to the Bible to learn what God has for us, to learn skills for success in life. And has anybody ever used an ax to chop down a tree before or anything? Only a couple of us? Have you ever used an ax to cut down a tree and it's dull? It is so hard. And so when you want to build into your life to make things a little easier for yourself, to be able to accomplish things better, to become more successful, you gain skills. You want to learn skills. And that's what this series is all about. Because when you don't have those skills, you become tired and you're not as successful at things. And so that is why this scripture is such a wonderful life scripture to have. Pastor James has given me a topic to, to, to dive into, to read about. We're actually looking in 1 Samuel, and we're in chapter 17. And it's about David and Goliath, a wonderful, wonderful story. And it's very well known as well. I remember growing up learning this story in children's and even taught it in children's as well. And there's so much you actually can learn just from David, David's life and his story about when he's fighting this big giant in his life. And let's actually look at the beginning here. And it says in, um, in 1 Samuel, it says, Now the Philistines had gathered their forces for war. They occupied one hill and the Israelites another. It's actually really important to know that. As these guys were coming up to fight each other, one was on one hill, the other was on the other. And then there was this valley. There was a valley between them. So these guys are posted up on top of this hill, and they're looking at each other. And they're like, you go down there. No, you go down there. No, you go down there. I'm not going down there. And these guys wouldn't go down into this valley. Because if they went down into this valley and then had to come up the other mountain, they lose their tactical advantage. So they were just, it's a stare off at this point, looking at each other. And this, this is why Goliath ends up coming down. Well, let's continue. It says, a champion named Goliath from Goth came out of the Philistine camp. He was a giant of a man over nine feet tall, and he's wearing a huge bronze helmet and a coat of bronze armor that weighed over 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leggings and slung a huge bronze javelin over his back. The iron spearhead alone weighed 15 pounds, and a soldier with a large shield always walked in front of Goliath. This guy sounds like a guy not to even mess with. And as I was reading through Samuel, I thought, the chances of me coming up against a guy like this is very small. At least I hope very small, because I don't want to mess with a guy like that. And so I recognize there's actually things that David encounters, other giants in his life, wasn't a physical person, but other giants that dealt with in his mind things that he had overcome. And so I named this sermon Toe-to-Toe -to -toe with Giants. Because before he even got to the battleground with Goliath, he had to face four different giants in his life. Now let's get, before we get into that, I want to give you guys some backstory. In chapter 16 in Samuel, so the book of Samuel is about a chief leader, religious leader in Israel at that time, and he's the prophet of Israel. And God had told him, I want you to go to Bethlehem and find a guy named Jesse and find his son and anoint his son as the new king of Israel. Now the king at this time is still alive and he's well alive and it's Saul. So Samuel is actually doing this as like a secret mission because if Saul knew what was happening, he definitely is going to make a stop to this because he had lost, Saul had lost the anointing of God to be king of Israel because of disobedience. So Jesse, I'm sorry, Samuel is on his way. He finds Jesse and says, hey, Jesse, I need to see your son. 
And he says, well, he says, do you have any sons? He says, actually, I've got eight. You know, which one do you want to see? He goes, all of them. I want to see all of them. So Jesse brings out his seven sons. Interesting, seven. Brings out seven, shows it to him. He shows him the first and the oldest, and he says, he looks at him, Samuel looks at him and says, nope, you're not it. He brings out the second oldest. They're big. Nope, you're not it. The third, nope, you're not it either. He goes down the line and he says, do you have any other sons? Samuel looks at Jesse and says, do you have any other sons? And he says, well, yeah, David, but he's the littlest. He's the scrawniest. He's out with the sheep. You don't want to see, you don't want him. Samuel says, we're not moving. We're not going anywhere until you bring him. So Jesse goes, all right. So he brings in David. Samuel looks at him and says, you are going to be the new king of Israel. God has anointed you as the new king of Israel. You know what happens right after that? Absolutely nothing. Nothing happens. Jesse looks at David and says, okay, well, you need to go back out and take care of those sheep, okay? He wasn't like, my son, David, is going to be the king. Let's get this going. Let's figure this out. Let's get you ready. Let's prepare you. No, no. He says, you need to go back out there and take care of the sheep that we have for you. Which actually brings me to the very first fill-in for us. The first giant David fit, uh, faced, and the first giants that we, and giants that we face in our life as well, that keep us and delay us from moving forward from something that God has given us, is a delay. His dad held him back. We have delays in our life that hold us back from what God has placed in our heart. Maybe some dreams that God has placed in our heart. Let's look at verse 12 through 15. It says, now David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. His three older brothers, they're the big, big strong ones, enlisted in Saul's army. But David was held back to care for the sheep in Bethlehem. Some of us are held back from people in our lives. Sometimes we're held back in life because maybe you're a ginger. Maybe you're a woman and you've been held back from something in your life. Maybe it's your race that something's been held back. Maybe you're not pretty enough or maybe you're not handsome enough. Maybe you're not athletic enough and that, it's holding, that people are holding you back. Maybe you're not smart enough and, and people are saying you can't do this and there's a delay in your life. People sometimes put delays in our life that God has for us. And God has plans for your life, but also people have plans for your life as well. David had his dad think little of him. Jesse says, I want you to be taking care of the sheep. I have plans for you to take care of that. I have my own plans for you, for your life. God looked at him and says, I have different plans, bigger plans. You're going to be the king of Israel. Later on here, Jesse sends, actually, David's dad sends Jesse out to the front lines. So the battle is going on. He sends him out to the front lines and and asks him to take food to his brothers. He's being obedient here. He's being a servant, actually. And I spoke on, on that once before. So now he's actually, because he's willingly to go and help his brothers out to take them food, he gets to actually see the fight and hear David or hear Goliath. And so he sends him out. He hears Goliath shouting. And every day he's shouting something. And he's shouting that you guys are going to be beaten. You guys are going to get killed. You guys are no good. He's telling the army this. You guys are going to die. And everyone is scared. And David notices everyone's in fear as he gets there. And he sees this. And he's like, what? what's going on? And this brings me to my second point. The second thing that puts in our way, the second giant and obstacle in our lives, and in David's life here, is a is discouragement. Everyone around David was discouraged. No one thought that they could do it. No one thought they can keep going forward. No one thought that they can take on Goliath. Everyone is in fear. No one had hope. 
They convinced themselves that no one could do it. That was the talk amongst themselves. And Goliath had created this culture of fear from being out there because he went out and he challenged the nation army of Israel to come and fight him. And just by him speaking and saying things to the army, he created this culture of fear. In verse 8 through 11, it says in Samuel, it says, Each day Goliath would stand out and shout at the ranks of Israel's army. Who do, who do you come out here? Oh, I'm sorry. Why do you come out here and line up for battle? Choose one man to fight me. Choose one man to fight. If he's able to kill me, he will become your subjects. We will become your subjects. But if I kill him, you'll become our subjects. Day after day, Goliath shouted and he taunted this at him saying, this, uh, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, everyone was deeply shaken and paralyzed with fear. So let's look at this. This one guy comes and he's shouting this and he's saying this and he's created this climate of fear and he's just demoralized everyone, one person. They're full of anxiety now. Some are terrified, even traumatized. They don't know what to do. No one wants to go anything or go anywhere to do anything because of this fear that's paralyzing them. Have any of you guys been in a home like that, a family like that, that's just paralyzing you from fear? Or maybe your job and your work and your office, you're afraid of what to do, to say something, to act something because of what the outcome might be. Have you been crippled by this fear? being afraid of something because of what someone else has said. This was a conventional wisdom amongst the Israelite army. This is the culture that now the army had, Saul's army had. And then the majority opinion was, we can't do this. And the public opinion was, they can't do this. This is what's been created. And it's, in, it's good to know that majority opinion, public opinion, isn't always right. There's so much in our culture because of a certain opinion that isn't right. There's a lot of beliefs in cultures that aren't right. The last time I talked, I talked about Moses and how he took the Israelites through the desert. From, he delivered them from Egypt. And they got to the promised land because that's where God told them that they, he wanted Moses to take them. I have somewhere better for you. And they get there. And Moses sends 10 spies into the land to see What's happening there? What's going on in that land? The 10 come back and they report to Moses. Eight of them say, we can't do this. What's coming that we're going to go into, we can't handle. We can't do this. Only two says we can do this. Those eight people had created fear among that nation of Israel at that time. Thousands of thousands of people now start talking amongst themselves and afraid of what's going to happen if they go into that land. If God had taken them out of Egypt and all the way through that desert and brought them to the point to enter the, the promised land, don't you think God is going to take them through into that land? They were so scared, though, because of what the majority of people had thought and said because of the negativity that was being talked. They were listening, all of them. The people with Moses, the army of Israel, were all listening to the wrong voice that was being said. They were listening to the wrong stuff. They're listening to, I, you can't do this. Verse 16, it says, For 40 days, twice a day, morning and evening, the Philistine giant loudly berated the Israelite army. That is all they heard was, you're going to die. You guys are worthless. You can't take us on. And my question is, is who are you listening to in your life? When you're around negative people, you become negative. When you're around fearful people, you become fearful. When you're around cowards, you become cowards. The people you circle yourself around or you allow circle you is who you become. What you listen to is what you believe into. 
David shows up now on the front line here. And he sees these people and he hears Goliath, but he's not infected of what Goliath has been saying. Verse 23 through 24 says, as David talked to his brothers on the front line, he saw Goliath start shouting his usual threats to Israel's army. When the army heard Goliath, they all ran away in fear. And they all ran away in terror. Don't be around people who are going to bring fear into your life. Don't be around people who are going to bring terror in your life, negative in your life. Brings me to my next point, the third point disapproval. David was about to fight this giant and he had disapproval from people. When we fight giants in our life, we will be shown disapproval in our lives too. His brothers questioned his motives. David faced disapproval and his brothers questioned his motives here. David was willing to face these disapprovals, though, from the other people all around him. A lot of times when we face people, we want people to always approve of everything that we do. This is very challenging for people who are people pleasers because we want people to think highly of us. We want people to think good of us. We want people to, to think they're good, we're good at something. Or... Or we want people to be on our side when we're doing everything, even though it might be different. David had this disapproval from his brothers. A lot of times, this disapproval comes from people who are closest to us. They don't see what God has put in your heart and your life. They don't see what dream that God has given you. They only see the mess-ups that you've made. They only see the habits that you've past had. They don't see what God sees. They don't see what's, what, how you're going to overcome things. This is what David's brothers had seen. In verse 26 through 29, David asked, what's the reward for killing this Philistine and ending this disgraceful abuse? When David's older brother heard this, he burned with anger at David and said, why are you even here anyways? Why aren't you taking care of your scrawny little flock of sheep? You cocky little brat. I know how conceited you are. Can you guys hear the rivalry between the family there? Have you guys experienced that with your brothers and sisters? And they're like, I don't think you can do this. Who do you think you are? You can do this. I know, I know who you really are. And David says, now what have I done? I can't even ask a question. And the sad truth, guys, is our families would be the ones who disapprove of what God has placed in your life. They just don't get it sometimes. It might be because of jealousy. I don't know what it is. But they will disapprove because they don't see what the Lord has put in, in your life. And then it leads to resentment between you guys and between the families and each other. And actually, Jesus had, had this as well. Can you imagine Jesus being your brother? And you guys are just, you know, in a room or something. And, and you're like, Mom! Jesus is being mean to me. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not. And the mom's like, Jesus, this is Jesus, okay? He can't lie, so. Can you just imagine? That would be... But his own half-brothers and half-sisters did not believe who he said he was. Jesus proclaimed that he is the Son of God. They didn't believe it until he died and rose again. And then he was walking among them. Or then, I, yeah, I'd be a believer then too. But our family sometimes is the ones that disapprove of us. And the only approval we should really be worried about is the approval of God. The more important is God's approval than other people's approval because we're doing something that God has set in our life. Because usually when God gives us direction to dream, it is to change something for the better. It is to, to succeed in something. 
My fourth thing is doubt. David had come across doubt from experts. Doubt that he could not do this. And when doubt sets in, you start thinking, can I do this? Am I capable of doing this? Do I have what it takes to do this? And there's people all around us who will put this in us. And in David's case, it was King Saul. David actually had a relationship with Saul. But David, I'm sorry, Saul grew up in the battlefield. He knew how to fight. He knew how the army should be working. He knew everything about it. He was the expert here. And then when he heard that David, this little guy who tend the sheep, was saying, I'm going to go out there and defeat Goliath, he said, I think I need to talk to this guy. I probably would have said the same thing to him because I wouldn't worry about him. I know how battles go. I, I have a good judge of how people are. I'm sure that's what King Saul was thinking. So he says, I want to see, see David. And this is what David actually says to Saul in verse 32 through 33. Don't worry about a thing, David told the king. I'll fight the Philistine. This might sound like he's a little cocky, right? But confidence in God may seem like they are cocky, but it's confidence in God that he can do it. Not that he can do it on his own, but that God's going to use him to do it. And some people might think it wrong. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can go against the Philistine. You're only a boy, and he's been a professional warrior all his life. The expert was telling him he couldn't do it, and he wasn't strong enough, capable enough. He was doubting him. Experts are often wrong when God is in play. Experts are wrong. The Wright brothers were just told that they could not curate something that could fly. And we've got planes. Moses, when he took the Israelites through the desert, over and over and over again, the people said, we aren't going to make this. And it's actually annoying as you read through it because they do every time. People didn't say we're going to land on the moon. We land on the moon. Some people don't think we land on the moon, but I put them right there with the flat earth people. How do you go toe-to-toe with giants in our lives, though? We hear this. We know there's delays. We know there's people that are going against us. We know there's the doubts. And David actually shows us this. We do as David does. How he he feats the Goliath of his life before he even faces the actual Goliath. The first one is, remember how God has helped me in the past. Remembering what God has done for me is such a huge confidence booster. When you recall the things that God has done for you, time after time after time, the little things. Remember when I was down and out and I, and I made it through? Remember I was in that valley? I didn't think I was going to get out of it, but I made it out. Remember when I didn't think this was going to work, but it worked? Remember when I thought I was alone, but I wasn't? Remember when God helps you in the little things, he's going to help you in the big things. God loves you yesterday. He loves you today, and he'll love you tomorrow. Because God is never changing, unchanging. He never changes. So when he says he'll help you in little things, he will help you in the big things too. Verse 36 through 37. And protecting my sheep, I've killed both a lion and a bear. The Lord who delivered me from the teeth of that lion and the claws of that bear will surely now deliver me from the Philistine too. That's confidence. 
He remembered what God had done for him. The second thing, use the tools God has given me now. Don't wait until you need, until you think you need something. Don't wait until you're more educated. Don't wait till you have more money. Don't wait. Use what you've got now. Use the tools God has given you now. If we look at David, when he was going to fight Goliath, he used what he had then and there now, what he was good with. If you're going to wait for something to come along, you're going to be waiting a long time. He had a sling and he had those rocks. He was an expert at that slingshot. David did tell him, I'm sorry, Saul did tell him, you can wear my armor to fight him. And people will say, you can do things. Let me help you out with this here. That's good. You can use my business model because this will help you out if you don't know what to do. But sometimes those things will weigh us down. 38, verse 38 through 40, Saul wanted to give David his armor. He says, then Saul dressed David in his own armor. But David said, I cannot go out in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Instead, he chose five smooth stones for his sling. All David had was his sling, and he knew how to use it. He couldn't use someone else's stuff because it wasn't for him. God gives us specific things to use. We're not all the same. We're all unique. Don't try to be someone else. Don't try to use other people's things as God is leading you in your direction in your life, as God has given you a dream. He's told you he's giving you stuff right now. And he'll continue to give you stuff. Because if we're starting to use other people's things, we will fail. It wasn't meant for you. The third thing is ignore the opposers. There is people who are going to oppose you in what God has put in your life. There are people who are going to oppose you for the dreams that God has, has laid out in front of you. David did not get any encouragement as he was about to go into battle with Goliath. Isn't that interesting? You think that people will, will be rooting for him for saying, you got this. He didn't get any encouragement. He had to encourage himself. There's a key here in this. In 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, it says, when others were speaking against him, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Do you encourage yourself in the Lord? We need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. It's more than just positive thinking. It's more than just a positive attitude. It is far deeper than that. When we encourage ourselves in the Lord, we're encouraging ourselves by, we're, we're standing on this bedrock of God's trust. We're standing on God's grace. We're standing on God's power, his kindness, his security. His provision, it's more than a positive attitude. I, I agree, we definitely need positive attitude. It's better than the, than the, than the opposite, which is negative attitude. But family, when we're, when we're faced with these giants that are, that are the darkest times in our lives, we need God's provision. When there's, this, there's an illness and sickness that has just grabbed you and your family, we need God's power. We need God's insight. We need God's kindness. We need God's courage. Going through a divorce, whatever these things are. When Danica was 25 weeks, she came at 25 weeks. They had seconds to innovate her, integrate her, or else she would die. I need God's encouragement of whatever happens there. We need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We need his faith, his power that no one else can give us. Our fifth thing, expect God to give me his glory. Expect God to give me his glory. This is what David had did, done. And this is what we need to do as we go after what God has laid in our life. And this is the faith factor. As David is running into battle against Goliath, as he is heading straight for him and towards him, 
This is what he shouts in verse 45 and 47. David shouted to Goliath, you come at me with the sword, spear, and javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Today the Lord will conquer you, and the whole world will know you that there is a God. And everyone will know that the Lord doesn't need weapons to rescue his people. It is his battle. Are you guys tired of fighting his battle? It is his battle, not ours. The Lord will give you to us. What are you expecting from God? What do you expect from him? Do you expect God to be a big God or a small God? Because whatever you expect of him is what you get from him. I expect big from God. We face so many different giants in our lives. And we need God to help us fight those giants to go toe to toe with them. Just like David before he even fought Goliath. People will oppose us. People will drag us down. People will be negative. But we need God to encourage us. We need his faith. Guys, stand with me. God loves you guys. He loves every single one of you. He has plans for every single one of your lives, and they're great. Some of you guys might not know who Christ is, or maybe never accepted Christ. And he's here, and he's willing to be that God for you, to take you through these big giants in your life. With every eye bowed, every head bowed, every eye closed, and you want to accept Jesus to be the God of your life, to take on these giants, I invite you right now by simply just raising your hand, acknowledging, yes, 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 yes. That's awesome. Yes, yes. Lord, we love you. We love who you are and who you say we are. We love that you can take on these battles for us, that we don't have to fight them. We feel like we have to, but you're the one that fights them for us. And we can go toe to toe against these Goliaths in our lives because of you. So many here have accepted you. And I, I tell you now that you have accepted Christ to be your savior. You just ask for forgiveness and believe in him that he died for you. And he is here to fight for you. And he's here to stay with you when we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.